My friend Andre lived in Khabarovsk in the Krasnoflotsky district and studied at a technical school. He was a sociable guy, loved playing soy songs on his guitar, and had a passion for outdoor adventures. His active lifestyle often interfered with his studies, but he always managed to pull through. He was an activist and even performed in the local student KVN comedy competitions. One of Andre's biggest hobbies was urban exploration. He was hooked on exploring abandoned sites, from construction projects to empty hospitals and old factories. Unlike others in his group who posted photos or videos online, Andre did it purely for the thrill. He did not care for trophies or attention. He simply loved exploring these forgotten places, feeling the quiet rush of discovery. But by the time he reached his third year of school, Andre started to settle down. He got a steady girlfriend, grew a beard, and had explored almost every interesting place in the city. Life became somewhat boring. He focused on his studies, developed a casual beer habit, partied with his friends, and even began considering a marriage. One April evening, Andre burst into my apartment. Without even taking off his jacket, he grabbed a pen and paper and started explaining his latest find. Look, he said excitedly, I found something online. There's an old, abandoned sewer collector in the forest park outside the city. It's an old, unused branch, so there's hardly any water. I could not find any blueprints, so I'll map it myself on site. I'm telling you this, just in case anything happens, you'll know where I went. He quickly drew a rough map of the city, marking the location with an X. I was amused by what he said, and wished him good luck. Andre stuck around for a little while longer, had some tea, and left. He was in a hurry. The next day, Andre did not show up for class. No one was concerned at first. He was known for skipping classes. But by the third day, his parents grew worried. Andre had gone off on spontaneous adventures before, but he always called to let them know he was okay. His parents contacted Andre's friends. I was the last person who saw him, so they contacted me first. I had the map and remembered the trip that Andre had planned, and I relayed it back to them. I reassured them that Andre was experienced and well prepared, but his mother had a bad feeling. She had not slept the night before, feeling uneasy. Her face even tingled, like needles pricking her skin, something she had never experienced before. Eventually, his parents reached out to the local ministry of emergency situations. They explained the situation and showed them the hand-drawn map. After some digging, the officer found the old collector plans. It was an entire network of tunnels, abandoned for over 20 years. A search team was assembled, including three of Andre's friends who were also urban explorers. They set out for the forest park, leaving the parents behind at the ministry's headquarters. The park was quiet and peaceful. Following the map, they found the entrance, a rusty, half-open hatch hidden by weeds on a grassy hill. They shone their flashlights down and saw a set of stairs descending into darkness. For the next two hours, they systematically searched the upper level of the collector. It was an eerie place. Damp, moldy concrete walls, rusty sensors, and pipes. Rats scurried underfoot, adding to the claustrophobic feeling of being buried underground. In the dim corridors, they found chalk marks on the walls, confirming that Andre had been there and had carefully mapped his route. One of his friends suggested Andre might have already left the tunnels and was just off drinking with some acquaintance. It sounded plausible, but they decided to keep searching. Eventually, they reached the entrance to the lower level. The officer explained that this part of the collector, which had once carried water, was 15 meters below. It was sealed off when the system was decommissioned, leaving only one entrance and exit. The drain pipes were blocked and had not been used in years. They stood over the dark shaft, shining their flashlights into the abyss. The light did not reach the bottom. They decided to descend, securing themselves with rope as they went down. One of Andre's other friends went first. As he descended, the stale air and cramped space made the journey terrifying. About seven meters down, one of the iron crossbars gave way, sending the friend dangling from the rope. Once safely lowered to the bottom, he saw that several more steps had broken off the same way. 
He and another person descended the rest of the way carefully. The lower tunnel was sloped and damp, with greasy mud underfoot and a strong smell of rot. The tunnel ended in two large, blocked drain pipes before allowing any light for. That's where they found Andre. They pieced together what likely happened. Andre had descended without proper climbing gear, probably holding his flashlight in his mouth. Halfway down, his flashlight slipped and fell. When he reached for it, a step gave way, and he plunged down the shaft, crashing against the protruding ledges on his way. He survived the fall, but was badly injured, likely damaging his spine. With no way to climb back up, he crawled toward the faint light at the end of the tunnel, unaware that the exit was blocked by grates. He made it to the dead end, leaned against the wall to rest and died there, but his death was not from his injuries, nor from pain or hunger. It had only been three days, and there was water, condensation on the walls, and muddy pools on the floor. It was the rats. When the rescue officer saw Andre's body, he was haunted by it for days. His friend recalled Andre's mother's eerie words. The rats had eaten Andre's face down to the bone. His eyes, nose, lips, and ears, they were all gone. First, let me explain a bit about my surroundings. I live in a Dacha village south of Moscow, nestled in the countryside. Nearby, there are gardening associations, remnants of former collective farm fields, a forest, an estate that now serves as a holiday home, and a boarding school housed in one of the estate's buildings. Some structures are half destroyed, but repairs are underway. One winter evening, I was walking home from my girlfriend's house. I had disembarked from the bus and set off on foot. It was about a three kilometer trek to my house, first along the estate, then past the lake, through the forest, and finally through the gardening association. As I walked, the sky was clear, with the moon and stars shining brightly. Approaching the edge of the estate on the hill, I noticed a flickering light in an old outbuilding, almost like a candle. I assumed they had started repairs. I continued my journey and eventually reached home. That concluded the backstory. On the weekend of February 23rd, my friends and I decided to embark on an overnight hiking trip. We went skiing, traversed various ravines, and by evening, we set up our tent at the edge of a ravine, not far from the lake. Everything was going well. It was just getting dark, and we were brewing tea on a burner when I suddenly craved cookies. Two of us headed to the store along a well-trodden path. Unexpectedly, we came across splatters of blood and some wool scattered around. It was unsettling, but we guessed it was from a dogfight. After making our purchase, we returned to find our third friend missing from the tent. We tried calling him, but his mobile was here, along with his jacket. It was freezing outside. Panic sat in as we shouted his name, and just then, a hand emerged from a snowdraft and grabbed my leg. It was a poorly timed joke, but made everyone laugh. Once we calmed down, we drank tea, read scary stories, and eventually fell asleep. We woke up early, packed up the tent, and made more tea. As we were about to leave, we noticed a closed sewer hatch in the snowdraft. Using a shovel, we pried it open and shone a flashlight inside. Its rusty metal brackets were old and worn. Should we venture down? Curiosity won, and we climbed in, exploring the damp space. An unpleasant odor filled the air, and we spotted a rat scurrying by. It looked like a small fork in the sewer, and suddenly, we noticed a missing brick in one wall. Shining our flashlight through the gap, we discovered another room. With some playful swearing, we kicked at the crumbling masonry and crawled through. The corridor seemed to stretch on for about a hundred meters, with a downward slope, and unease began to settle in. We checked our watches. It was already two in the afternoon. Should we turn back and explore later? No, we decided to push on. As we moved forward, we encountered another wall, but this time, we found a small hole on the side, seemingly dug by paws rather than hands. Our earlier bravado faded, and we turned back. The tunnel felt endless, and fear gripped us as we began to run. As we sprinted, I realized that the water was no longer splashing beneath our feet. It had turned dry. I stopped, 
and the others crashed into me from behind. We looked around. The walls were made of old, moldy bricks, coated in cobwebs, and the earthen floor was marked with tracks, either from a dog or something else. The realization hit us hard. It was surreal to walk for a hundred meters in one direction, only to find another corridor stretching ahead with no end in sight. With dread, we started whispering about our next move, when a piercing scream echoed from ahead, sharp and chilling, accompanied by other unsettling sounds. Panic surged through me. Everything unfolded so quickly, and my mind clouded with fear, leaving me with fragmented, yet vivid images like snapshots. The sounds grew closer, and suddenly, Kay screamed, prompting us to run together. I was the last one, glancing back every moment, paralyzed by a terrifying thought. What if I fell right now? That fear consumed me, making my knees buckle. Just then, Kay stumbled and collided with a brick wall. We found ourselves at another wall, but this one had a hole. Without thinking, we crawled through. I was the last to go, and the sound of those footsteps drew nearer. My friends pulled me by the arms, but then I felt a grip on my foot. I did not feel pain. All I could think was that I wouldn't be dragged away. Kay swung a brick at whatever was holding me, and in an instant, it released its grip. Suddenly, silence enveloped us, a warm, unsettling stillness. We exchanged glances, wordlessly understanding our shared fear. We stood in another tunnel with an earthen floor, but this time, there were only human footprints. Just then, that scream pierced the air again. Frustration boiled inside me. I felt tears welling up as I pounded my fist against the wall where this creature lurked. I came to my senses as we climbed a spiral staircase, my friends pulling me along. They noticed I was awake again, and we continued ascending. After a while, niches began to appear in the walls, inexplicably filled with candles. Despite having our lanterns, the flickering candle flames failed to uplift our spirits. Suddenly, Kay exclaimed that someone was descending the stairs. We froze, panic rising. Behind us looked that creature, possibly having crawled through the hole, and ahead, footsteps approached, up the stairs in this wretched tunnel. We quickly hid in a niche, placing one lantern on the floor and turning off ours. The footsteps drew closer, each slap slap echoing ominously. Then, around the corner, emerged a girl, about ten years old, wearing a light white dress. Her face was pale, twisting into a disturbing smile, and she hummed a lullaby. A chill ran down our spines. The eerie sound of the creature's squeal drifted up from below, causing the girl to pause, deep in thought, before continuing down the stairs. From the depths came the sound of a woman's voice singing the same haunting lullaby. We took off, sprinting up the stairs, making a deafening clatter. We climbed higher and higher, encountering the same niches and grotesque candles repeatedly. It felt like the nightmare would never end. Eventually, we hit a wall. No manhole, no door, just a solid barrier. I just felt despair. I wanted to cry, to sit down and wait for whatever fate awaited us in this dim corridor filled with the creature's dull jumps. Kay touched my shoulder and pointed to the ceiling. There was a ladder protruding from a round hole. I climbed up, followed by T, with Kay bringing up the rear. Just as Kay turned and shone the flashlight into the darkness, a piercing squeal erupted about three meters away. He jumped, grabbing the ladder as something slammed against the wall with a dull thud beneath him. Another squeal echoed as claws clicked on the ladder's rungs. We were climbing as quickly as we could. Again, there was nothing but silence around us, which was only broken by the shuffling of our feet on the steps. I crawled through, and suddenly, the walls on either side opened into a vast, vaulted room with tunnels branching off in different directions. It was terrifying. We crawled through the small chamber, and as we did, the walls changed shape, becoming square. As we climbed, we caught sight of a room through the fog of our minds. Children gathered around a table, lit by a sinister candle, playing cards. In their midst, something slivered or darted in. A grotesque creature, resembling a stout dog, but with thick legs and a face that was anything but canine. 
I barely caught a glimpse before the old woman, flabby and hunched, locked eyes with us. My friends later told me they could feel her gaze on their skin. It was penetrating and unsettling. With a shriek of anger, she pointed at us and the other figures, except for the children, and a towering shadow, cloaked in darkness, extended their hand towards us, but these weren't hands. They felt more like thoughts pressing against us, urging us to abandon our escape and join them. Yet, an invisible boundary kept us from crossing over. We crawled through the second floor of the house, an empty gloomy room littered with junk and covered windows, until we suddenly found ourselves on the roof of the old estate outbuilding. The iron roof was slippery and coated in snow. We clambered out, disoriented, the view disconcerting. It felt strange to be above everything, the house looming beneath us. As night fell, a rustling noise stirred under the roof and a candle flickered in the window. I don't remember how we jumped off the roof or raced to our backpacks, but once we regained our senses, we ran home faster than ever, needing to cross the forest to get there. Now it's March. I thought I would be able to forget. I spent a week at home, telling my parents I was sick, which I truly was. I didn't turn off the light at night, glued to the TV or a book. This horrifying ordeal had unfolded only three kilometers from my house. I now walked past the estate from a distance, taking a different bus home. Yet every night, I dream of that gaze from the attic window. It's grotesque and revolting, huge, swollen white eyes, each with multiple pupils shifting within them, all of them staring at me. Those eyes blink so often that the eyelids almost close sideways. I also saw the face behind those eyes in the candlelight, a pale, aristocratic woman with a disconcertingly friendly smile. Just the other day, I dreamed of walking through that tunnel again, hearing her lullaby echoing behind me. It freaks me out. Live in Honduras. Med school. Public health rotation. Honduras is a third world country. Me and my partner go from house to house, checking water deposits, not being infected with mosquito larvae. We go to the shittiest shithole of the downtown area. The whole block makes approximately 10 houses. The majority in good conditions, except two wood shitholes. Here it gets kind of weirder. The entire street from the block is not pavement. It's just a dirty road full of rocks. Many cockroaches on the street. There is no garbage on roads. Not kidding, an exaggerating amount of cockroaches of all sizes and colors. We go to shithole number one. It's full of cockroaches. Even children react normally to them. Partner is terrified, hates cockroaches. We ask of our neighbors how they deal with cockroaches. They tell us they spend a lot on exterminators and even buy geckos and release them on their backyards. Main problem is, the two shitholes from the block, they are poor families, but that's no excuse according to many. In shithole number one, a kid eating its lunch, three cockroaches land near his lunch, but he normally pushes them away from the table. Vomit, nope. Finally, we check everything, we leave shithole one, arrive at shithole two. Reminds me why we are a third world country. It's a cantina. Old fucker sells alcohol. But amazingly, sanitary conditions are from a sewer dump. Enter to check water deposits. Shit got real. Watch a large number of cockroaches. I'm not afraid of cockroaches, but it seems like an ant hole. Nope, out of there. Leave them some pamphlets and a bet. Chemical for killing larvae in water deposits. Old fucker is mad and drunk and yells at us. We leave. Next and last house. Clean house. We are exhausted. Walking hours and the temperature is hot. Partner is terrified with the amount of cockroaches. Mentions it to the owner of the last house. He tells us that supposedly the cockroaches come from underground. There is no sewer system underground. Just old caves and tunnels like the majority of Honduras. Men tells us probably there is something underground, like a giant hive of cockroaches. Spend entire day thinking about the cockroaches. A whole colony of cockroaches underground, probably from a prehistoric era. Among the colony, the queen planning its resurgence. The main queen waiting for human extinction to feed on our carcass. Waiting while sending cockroaches. Oh, someone's been playing Gears of War. 
Hi X, first time posting here. I'm a mostly skeptical guy, and I'm going to post about some stuff that happened to me, which I found curious, weird, or impressive, on how the brain processes stuff it perceives. I want to know your opinion. First one, live in a building from around 1930 that is considered a national monument. Looks like a weird building with towers. Has an inner garden, size of a football field, maybe more. Everyone walks their dog there. Walk the dog at late night for a couple days, like midnight or later. Barely any moonlight sometimes. It feels like darkness has swallowed half the garden. See a kid at like 50 meters away, at least the silhouette, and something that looks like a human face, facing towards me. Wonder what the fuck is that kid doing there that late? He vanishes. Realize it was just shadows, and my brain auto-completed it as a kid. Another night. Same circumstances. This time, it's an adult. Wonder who the fuck is that person. Vanishes. Fuck them shadows. Now, the garden has some areas with bushes and larger trees. Dog quickly enters said area. Starts smelling some bushes like she has found something. Think it's a cat by how my dog is acting. Tell her to come back, but she refuses. Some bushes suddenly move. What? There are lots of leaves on the ground. See like something invisible steps on them, step by step, walking towards me. I just stand there looking. It stops just in front of me. Feel like there is something just a meter from me. Tell my dog to get the fuck out of there and leave. It felt really weird. I always assumed it was just wind and shadows messing with my brain. But at the time, it felt kind of unsettling. And I know it feels really stupid compared to other stories told here, but want to know what you think. Had to move back with parents. They now live in a small as fuck village. It's a three-story house, side by side to another abandoned house. 2am, lying on my bed, doing whatever with my phone. Hear noise upstairs. Something fell to the floor, like a tool or something. Hear an old man's voice, sighing several times. Think it's the upstairs neighbors. Realize I no longer live in an apartment, and we don't have neighbors since the upper floor is empty. Grab a knife and a lantern. Go upstairs and see nothing. Go back to my room. Different night, at 2am. Start hearing a woman's voice wailing. It goes on for several minutes and stops. Wonder what the fuck is that? Now I no longer hear these voices slash sounds, but there is a new one. Same hour. Something like an intestine sound, but more artificial repeating itself each two seconds or so, then stopping for 30 seconds and starting again. And that's it. What the fuck is happening to my house axe? I believe you may be dealing with a crawler unknowingly. I know you do not know what this is, but the best advice for your direct safety is to ensure that every door, window, and access point, including chimneys, are blocked off and locked critically at night. Furthermore, if you do find out the source of these issues to be a crawler, you will need to take more steps to ensure the safety of yourself or anybody you may be living with. I have encountered this being before, and somewhat more indirectly, several times. They are masters of the night, and masters of mimicking human voices, though their natural sounds are much more guttural if trying to frighten or clicky for other states. Watch this video to understand what I mean. Crawlers go by many names. I use crawler as it carries less baggage with it. You may have heard it called Skinwalker, Wendigo, Wreck, Jinn, etc., but the creature is one and the same. They are a species, it would seem. I think they are evil beings from my encounter. They are nocturnal, 7 to 8 feet tall, are incredibly fast, would easily make the fastest animal alive, accelerate very quickly, within the 120 pound range despite their size, are inhumanly skinny slash lanky, have a round mouth with sharp pointy teeth on the inside, have disgustingly dry and malnourished looking pale white skin, are masters at mimicry, both of humans and animals. Their presence is terrifying. Encounters can be profoundly fear-inducing. Mine convinced me that God is real, and I cannot sleep in front of a window anymore. They seem to be strong, with lethal claws. They are cave dwellers, and can move through tight cramped spaces with ease. They usually go on all fours, but not always. They have huge, pale white eyes that look like voids when in the dark. Do not look into them. If you ever find out if this creature that I describe is the one that you may have around, 
make another post via a gun and ideally get in contact with a priest. What leads me to suspect it is a crawler is the following. First one, late at night, lots of darkness, surrounded by an old, probably large building, likely connected to the sewer system directly. Being watched by a human looking form, hiding in some shadows. Dog is upset. I have been around and heard of dogs around these things. This happens. Some outright run. Some get very anxious. Bushes move, or movement from bushes, probably where it was at. Feel a strong presence, probably experiencing exceptional psychological distress, which is one of its tools for hunting humans. Being around them can result in a lot of confusion and senses overload. Second one, rural area. They like creeks, woods, and caves. Tall structure, next to an abandoned home. They like to live in those, easy homes for them. Late at night again, hearing a noise above you. You sure it can't be something walking or being on the roof? Hear something sighing. Nothing is actually inside the house, however. Woman wailing. This is a common theme and tactic in crawler stories, especially when it is intent on luring and hunting a male human being. It probably stopped as it got no response. Predatory. Testing behavior. It gets frustrated. Reverts to animalistic sounds. From deep and guttural to a weird type of chittering. Sounds kind of off because you have heard other things sound like this, but not quite like this at all. Be careful. Put in some reading. And if you can help it, don't be alone or unprotected at night. These beings are common. They are dangerous. You may want to see about putting up some cameras. They tend to avoid these. Prayer can help, but you gotta do it right. I like to say that a spiritual defense is the other half to having a gun when it comes to dealing with these things. They can be behaviorally, cowardly, or finicky. Sometimes really aggressive, but also avoidant or observant. But I cannot overstate this. They are very... Very fucking scary. Good luck. Something similar happened to me a few years ago. Be me. 15 year old Albertan. Live in small town. Kinda out of shape, but getting into shape. Start going for runs. Out one night. It's pretty dark. Decide to go for a longer run. Out in this field. Jump barbed wire into another field. Start feeling uneasy. Remember something I have been told about the field I'm in. Some girl's corpse was discovered stuffed in a couch in this field in the 80s. Lots of old ruins out here as well. Pioneer house that's somehow still standing. Get creeped out. Decide to be brave and not run too fast. Out of the corner of my eye, I catch something in the window of the house. It darts back in. Figure it was an animal, but speed up. I keep running for a bet and glance past. An arm slides out from behind the house. Very white, but sickly white. Elbows are in the wrong place. I start sprinting like hell. Look behind me again. The thing is running towards me with jerky motions. It was all elongated and messed up. Naked, pale white skin, covered in sores. Its face was the worst. The eyes were like human eyes, turned 90 degrees and bigger. Plus they were pitch black. No nose. Massive mouth with red lips and rows of sharp teeth opened in a no. I'm fucking sprinting as fast as I can, hitting fucking parkour moves, but it's catching up. Up ahead is an old church, still in use, but dilapidated. I vault the fence over the line, and the thing tries to jump it, but it shrieks when it passes the property line. It stares at me and lumbers off. I got a friend to come pick me up, made it home. Still live in the area, thinking of hunting it. Does anyone know what it could be? Be my uncle, Michael. Sensible, no-nonsense guy. Not easily rattled. Religiously conservative guy. Goes to Thailand for holiday. Returns after a bit under the weather. Decides to book doctor appointment. Calls up receptionist to confirm, slash double-check time. Hi, Michael. Confirming your appointment is on X date at X time with Dr. X. See you soon. Uncle sitting in waiting room early for his appointment. One of the receptionists gets a phone call. Hi Michael. Confirming your appointment is on X date at X time with X doctor. See you soon. Uncle thinks, wait a minute. 
I just had that fucking conversation. Approaches receptionist. Who was that on the phone? Receptionist says she is not at liberty to discuss client identity. Uncle tells receptionist his name is Michael and his appointment was on the exact same time with the same doctor. Receptionist is confused. Agrees to call back number that just called to double check any confusion or a double booking. Uncle's phone starts ringing. What happened? None of us can make any sense of it. 